Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Essential Guide to MIDI in Cubase. Today we're going to try to answer a seemingly simple question. What is a MIDI note? Well, it turns out that there's actually an awful lot of stuff inside a MIDI note and there's an awful lot of ways to look at it too and we'll see some of those in Cubase today. If you're enjoying this series, check out the Patreon and YouTube member links below. Fabulous way to help support me. First thing that we need to do is get the MIDI note recorded. Here we are on our MIDI track and we're going to record the MIDI note in a MIDI part. MIDI parts are absolutely critical for the health of MIDI information and we'll see that now. Let's record a note. Do you notice how the length of the bar snapped? It started at the beginning of the recording, snapped to the beginning of bar three. That's an option. If we go into edit preferences, record MIDI, snap MIDI parts to bars. I recommend you leave that on. It's really convenient when you're moving parts around to be able to snap to the grid and this is just the most convenient way to do it. This MIDI note exists inside this MIDI part. If I move the part forwards by a bar, the note jumps forward as well. But it's a much more fundamental relationship than that. The MIDI event has to exist inside a MIDI part. MIDI events don't have a context they won't play if they're not inside a MIDI part. Let's try moving the note outside the part and see what happens. Cubase is very unhappy indeed. It says the event's position exceeds the part's boundary. What do you want to do? And it gives us two options. We can either enlarge the part to make sure that the note is still inside or move anyway. If we move anyway, Cubase expresses its disapproval by turning the note gray. It will no longer play. So that note's now an orphan. It doesn't have a MIDI part associated with it. Cubase just won't acknowledge its existence. All MIDI data needs to exist inside a MIDI part. Now there's one small exception to this. It's a period of grace that we're granted. In the preferences, in the MIDI section, we've got this option, extend playback range of notes that start before the part. Now the distance forwards by which I moved this note was no accident. That distance there, two sixteenth notes, is 240 ticks. It's the biggest number that we can input in this box. I'll explain what a tick is shortly, but for the moment let's just click OK. The notes turn purple again. Cubase is once again happy, and we've basically extended the vision of this part. The part hasn't moved. This is like a grace period. It's looking backwards in time and grabbing that event and bringing it within the part and saying, come on, you join us over here. The reason this functionality exists is because if you're playing live, it's quite common that you'll play a note very slightly before the beginning of the part. Now, if you're recording them, ordinarily, Cubase will take care of that for you. It'll automatically extend the part as required in order to make the note fit inside it. But let's say you've quantized it or moved the notes manually, you might end up in this situation where the event is very, very slightly before the part. So that's why 240 is the absolute extreme. That's as far back as you can go. Typically, you'd only be looking at a few ticks. Now, I've mentioned the word ticks a couple of times without actually defining what it is. So let's talk about what a tick is. It's the smallest unit of measurement in the MIDI protocol. And here you can see in the preferences page that a 1 16th note equals 120 ticks. So here we have a bar from bar one to bar two split into four equal segments. Each one of these segments in between these slightly thicker black lines, that's a quarter note or one beat. The reason why we use the term quarter note to, to describe a beat is traditional. It's just a, a function of history that the most common um, time signature throughout the entire tradition of Western music is 4-4. Four, four. There are four beats in a bar uh, in the time signature 4-4. Four, four. And so we ended up defining this concept of the quarter note. In classical music, it's called a crotchet, but it's basically a quarter of a bar. If you split that down into four smaller segments of equal size, you have a 16th note. So we're defining a 16th note as containing 120 ticks. You then see this thing, uh, PPQ base for 480. Pulses per quarter note, or PPQ, basically describes the number of pulses, uh, which is a different word for describing ticks. I'm sorry, there's multiple definitions for everything. So if we have 120 ticks in a 16th note, 
we have four times as many as that in a quarter note. 480 ticks per quarter note, and that's what PPQ stands for. Now, the reason why I've gone to all of the effort of describing what a tick is, is because it matters. It's the length of a note. It's just not immediately obvious what significance they have, but it's actually this smallest number here. That's 92 ticks. If we zoom into this note, if I make it a little bit smaller, so this note's now a quarter note long, and that's the second largest of these divisions. So it goes bars, quarter notes, 16th notes, ticks. That's the four different sizes of measurement. Let's bring it down even smaller. It's now exactly one 16th note. Now I have to turn grid off in order to go any further. And if I carry on making this note smaller, we've now got 118 ticks and so on and so on and so on, all the way down to a tiny note that's 11 ticks long. If I zoom back out to some sort of reasonable scale, you can see that that's a, a microscopically small note. So it is important for us to be able to understand what ticks are, and very commonly we'll be basically quantizing or processing at that level. The next value in this um, status strip that I want to talk about is the channel, the MIDI channel number, because this is where a lot of confusion can arise when you're recording uh, and dealing with MIDI. The channel number up in the inspector, I set it to channel one explicitly. That's an output channel. It's only of interest to the plugin itself. This is the data saying to the plugin, I'm talking to you on channel one, play the piano, or channel two, play the marimba. It's got nothing to do with the incoming MIDI data. I can prove that very easily. I've configured my Native Instruments machine to output uh, one of its notes, the bottom left hand pad on the machine. I've configured it to output on channel two. So if I press this pad, there you can, it's sending out a channel two message. The, the machine is generating a MIDI channel two message, but it's being received on a MIDI track that's outputting channel one. So this MIDI track is receiving a channel two message, but outputting a channel one message. And the instance of Sonic SE, which has a piano loaded on channel one, is playing a piano. If I set this MIDI track to any, now the MIDI track doesn't care what channel data it receives, but it will output exactly whatever it receives. So now when I press the pad, we hear the marimba. To prove that there's a complete disconnect between input and output, I'm going to set it back to channel one and I'm going to record a note from my machine. Okay, you heard the piano, that's because that's what the output channel is communicating on. But that note was recorded as a MIDI channel two message. If I now set this track back to any, and play that note, we hear the marimba. So this is your output MIDI track. Got nothing to do with the information that's coming from the device. Now, as a matter of interest, the reason why I had to use the machine for that example is because my Native Instruments Complete keyboard only outputs MIDI channel one. I would have to go through, there are hoops you can jump through to make it generate, generate different MIDI channel numbers, but by default, when it's a slave inside the DAW like this, it only outputs MIDI channel one. So I couldn't actually configure that to output a MIDI channel two message, but I can with the machine. Now this feature of MIDI data whereby every single MIDI event stores its own MIDI channel information is important when we come to understand how that, how that information gets broadcast back to the outside world. Let's just stick on the single track for the moment, just to kind of clarify the definitions here. The note is fundamentally a MIDI channel 2 note, but if we override that behaviour by setting the track to a different explicit channel number, that then becomes the master and all notes inside this MIDI part will be subservient to the track's requirements. But tracks and parts are capable of outputting data on multiple MIDI channels simultaneously. In order to prove this, I'll get rid of that example. And we'll head back down to our uh, instance of Gymnopide down here. Now, you may recall in the last episode, we had three separate tracks outputting on uh, channels four, five, and six. Every single one of the notes on every single one of these tracks is recorded with that MIDI channel information embedded inside the note. 
But if I merge all of the information on all of those three tracks down into a single part, I'll do this very quickly because it's not really a subject for this particular series. What I've basically done there is merged all those three tracks together into a single part. Here you can see all the data. Here's the melody up at the top, output in channel four. Here are the chords, output in channel five. And here's the lower bass notes outputting on channel six. So as things stand, the entire track is gonna get played on the marimba because that's what channel four is configured to. If I set this track to any, there's the piano and the bass coming. So all of the information is in a single part on a single track. The different outputs, the different MIDI notes are being output on different channels and everything is perfectly happy Italian knows exactly what to do with that information. So we've got this split level hierarchy, the MIDI note underneath, which is the fundamental data, capable of being overridden by the MIDI track upon which that data lives. Just created myself a nice simple note on our original track that we started with, in order to describe a concept called chase events. Now I've just stopped the playing of that note halfway through. If I start, you hear the note immediately. So when, wherever I press play, over the length of that note, you're gonna hear it. That's a concept called chase events, and we find that in the preferences. These are the different types of MIDI events for which chase is activated. If I turn chase events off for notes and say okay, now when I press play in the middle of this note, you won't hear it. The reason why it's possible to turn chase events off is because it's difficult. Cubase basically has to go right back to the very beginning, potentially of the part or even the entire song, to see whether or not there are any notes that extend over the entire piece. Now there's a piece of music by Jean-Michel Jarre called Waiting for Cousteau, which is about 45 minutes long, and for about half of it, he presses a C down on the keyboard and just holds it, and there's this huge synth bluff that lasts. It's a very kind of trancey piece, and it might be 20 minutes long. There's tons of other stuff going on over the top, but this single note is playing for the entire time. If you jumped forwards 20 minutes in the song and you press play, and you had that song loaded in Cubase, it would need to basically process the entire song in order to figure out that that one note needed to be played. And the reason for that is that notes don't look like this in the actual MIDI world. You've got two separate MIDI events to, to represent this data. There's a note on event at the beginning of the note and then absolute silence and then a note off event at the end of the note. This rectangle that you see in the key editor is merely a representation of what those two events sum up to. It's not the actual truth of the way that the data is stored behind the scenes. So the next thing we need to look at is the MIDI monitor. Now I've added a MIDI monitor to the inserts of this track. It's basically just a MIDI insert, you can choose it. And if I turn it on, you can see that basically it displays every piece of MIDI information that gets played on this track. And here you can see the note on and the note off. There's no length information. There's no such thing as length information in a note on or a note off. They don't store the length of the played note. The plugin in conjunction with Cubase is doing the heavy lifting between those two events. When it receives the note on, it starts playing the note. This number here, the 79, is the velocity of the played note. Can you see as well that when I've let the note go, I must have pressed slightly harder into the note because my release velocity is actually 127. Release velocity is almost never used. It exists. It's a, it's a piece of information stored inside the MIDI protocol, but very few synthesizers use it. To all intents and purposes, you can ignore it. I don't think I've ever written a piece of music where the off velocity was important, but it does exist, it's there. One quick thing to look at before we uh, call it a day today is the list editor. You go to the MIDI menu, open list editor. You can't get to it from the editor screen down below, unfortunately. This contains every single MIDI event on the part. And you can see once again, it's an aggregation. This length value is spurious. The note on and note off events that actually exist in the real MIDI behind the scenes have been joined together to give you the composite length value. This can be a really useful tool if you ever end up with bad data. Sometimes I've seen notes in Cubase get a length value of less than zero 
and they mess your project up. They can ca cause havoc. If you head into the list editor, you can see them in here. Mm -hmm. Select the notes, and this is a convenient way to delete them because they won't be visible inside the key editor if they have a length of less than zero. Okay, that'll do us for today. I need a cup of tea. I'll see you for the next one. Thanks very much for watching.